Welcome to Palapinna Cowboy Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, this is your first time here to view Palapinna County Cowboy Church. We're glad that you're watching the video today. My name is Roger Keck. I am the pastor here at the church, and we want to invite you to continue to come back. Uh, PalapinnaCowboyChurch.com has all of the sermons on it, and uh, they are posted each week. And so I hope that you will uh, be able to look and check out these sermons for yourself. If you're searching for a church home, uh, I agree that that may be one of the best ways to, to figure out if you'd like to come visit us or not is by looking at us online. So I hope you get a chance to review several of those. Uh, if you'd like to come visit us uh, uh, in person, eyeball to eyeball, we are at 2731 South FM 129 in Santo, Texas, 76472. And we would be glad to have you. We'd like to shake your hand uh, and get to know you. Uh, if you are visiting up with us and you are looking uh, for a church home or you enjoy being able to watch the videos at the house and you would still like to be a part of this church, you can participate uh, by giving to this church and, and giving to the ministries of this church by going to the giving button uh, that is located at palapinacowboychurch.com under the title Giving, uh, and it will prompt prompt you uh, to go in there and be able to give towards the ministries of this church. If you're listening by Pure Country Radio, uh, and maybe you like doing that, uh, you can also do that as well. That helps take care of the cost associated with, uh, with broadcasting uh, radio uh, from this location. We're so glad that you're here. We'll hope that you join us. We hope that you come and see us. We look forward to getting a chance to meet you. God bless. Robert, if you would please flip your hand out over. And uh, join Debbie in singing, He Keeps Me Singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow.
Okay, this morning we have a special guest with us this morning, Miss Rachel Knight, and she's going to be singing a little bit of Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
Take me to your healing waters Take me down to your healing stream Jesus, lead me to your healing waters Take me down and wash me clean Many since I first loved you Now I'm out here Wondering on my own Never have I known more than I need you Than out here Wondering on This is the air I breathe. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning knowing that you are the great healer. We thank you for your mercy, for the grace that you give us. We pray again for those on our uh, list, dear Lord. We ask that you be with Roger as he brings our message to us this morning. We ask that you forgive us of our many sins. We ask this in thy blessed name and for thy sake. Amen. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Yeah. Amen. Some of you came back. Some of them, some of them didn't. Oh, yeah. Let's dismiss the kids. Yes, let's dismiss the children. You, you're off. You're done. We're going to dismiss the kids. <laughs> and whatever direction that Angie is over here, that's the way that you need to go, okay? All right. Kale, I think I'm in the monitor or something up here, brother. I think that's what's ringing. All right, very good. I'll tell you what. All right, we'll get these kids. By the way, let me just tell you real quickly, if you're contemplating not sending your kid to Kids Corral, today would be a really good day for you to do that. And, and I want to tell you why. Check, 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 check. It's in this monitor right here. Um, I'm going to tell you why. Is because we're going to have an adult conversation today. And this adult conversation, I really don't think, is too terribly appropriate for kids. And uh, so uh, if you, if, if you want to go ahead and send them on, that would probably be a really good idea. All right. <laughs> 
Let me, so let me try this one more time. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? Besides me. Okay, good. I made it a point, uh, I started to tell you a while ago, is that, you know, last week we had an awesome service. We had an incredible amount of people. And I want to thank all of you who uh, helped honor the veterans and the uh, uh, law enforcement with us. Uh, obviously, when you start preaching about the U.S. Constitution, some people leave. But not everybody. You're still back, aren't you? Yeah, amen. So, yeah, you know, and, and I've, I've talked to the elders about this. You know, and uh, one thing we're going to keep doing here is, uh, like it or not, we're going to keep preaching the truth. Amen? Yeah, we sure are. Somebody's got to do it. So uh, I think it falls on us. Uh, today, we are back on the Ten Commandments. How many of you have been here for all six prior commandments? All right, good. That's a lot of you. Maybe not all of you. Uh, how many of you know what the seventh commandment is? Not very many of you. And I'm going to tell you that is the reason why I didn't advertise that this week. <laughs> because I knew that if I advertised what the seventh commandment was, 90% of you would have stayed home today. Not that you have a problem with it. It's just that you don't like talking about it. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like talking about it either. I, I don't like talking about it so much that this is the one that I have not been looking forward to. You'll understand why here in a minute. Trust me, okay? Uh, I really have it. It's not in my comfort zone. It's not like what I like to discuss. It's not even what I like to talk about. Uh, if you know me at all, and, and here in a minute, these two ladies down here on the front row are going to turn about three shades of red, and they're going to go, the, I'll get this comment at lunch. I can't believe you said that. I'm just warning you ahead of time, okay? Yeah, okay, just warning you ahead of time. God's top ten list. I believe that God gave us a top ten list, and with every top ten or every one of these principles, we have something, a principle that we need to live by, correct? They are not outdated. They are not old-fashioned. They are just as applicable today as they were back when God gave them to Moses. Amen? Amen. Yes. So, uh, if you want to get your Bible, I'm not even going to have you stand because by the time I have you stand and read this, uh, it'll be about a half a second, okay? So, I'm going to let you look at it sitting down today. It's Exodus chapter 20, um, and I think it's verse 4, not 14. I hope we got that right. But it is, you shall not commit adultery. 14? Okay, I just put in the four. didn't put a one in front of my notes here. Okay, uh, 14. All right, so you shall not commit adultery. So here's what I want to tell you. If I had advertised that now, how many more of you would have showed back up today? Probably not a lot. You would? Well, good. See, that's about half. <laughs> if you look around, that's about half. So anyway, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of surprise you a little bit because maybe a surprise is what you need. Okay, y'all going to have to get better responses. This is going to be a long day for me, okay? I'm just going to tell you. It is. All right. All right. The principle of intimacy is what we're going to call this today. The principle of intimacy. And the principle tells us how to have intimacy inside of marriage. All right. Now, let me... Let me repeat that. I want to make sure we understand the, uh, the boundaries here. The principle tells us how to have intimacy inside of marriage. But it also tells us what will happen if we have intimacy outside of it. All right? Okay, good. Now, I expect some of you won't be back next week, so it's been great seeing you. All right? So, uh but I want to uh, share with you three ways that I believe that you can commit adultery. Three ways that I believe you can commit adultery, all right? So if you got a pen, I would r recommend you write this down, okay? I uh, recommend you write this down. Number one, um, by the way, let me say this before I give you the number one point. We are made up of three parts, right? We're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and and spirit. Now, real quickly, you know, I don't know about you guys. You can tell by looking at me that I have an insatiable appetite. I like 
to eat. No amen. You're just going to leave me hanging, huh? All right. I see how you are today. Okay. That's fine. Preacher's only one tell the truth around here, right? Okay. I like to eat. Now, here's the problem with eating, and anybody that uh, is a health nut is going to tell you this, that every time you eat foods that are not good for you, such as sugar, sugar makes you more hungry. Come on. I got, I, got, I got to get some fat people say amen with me here, right here. You know what I'm talking about? Let me, let me see some brothers over here. You know, some of you, come on. Sugar makes you more hungry. You know, you can be starving to death and eat something sweet, and in five minutes you're hungrier than you were to start with, right? Adultery is the sugar of the appetite. Adultery is the sugar of the appetite now, and I'll tell you what that appetite is, okay, here in just a minute. All right, uh, now, uh, let me see here. Number one, you can commit adultery in your own body. That is number one. You can commit adultery in your own body. And by the way, that sounds pretty self-explanatory, doesn't it? Most of us would say, okay, I get that part of it. So let me give you some scripture. Uh, if you got your Bible, uh, if you want to mark this in your Bible, I know Adam will probably put it up here. But 1 Corinthians six eighteen through 20. I know I got this one right. Okay. All right. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies, and notice that it says bodies here and not your spirit. Okay. He's talking about your body. All right. Uh, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. Now, the thing about it is, is, is if you've been born again, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. Amen? Amen? Okay, yes. You are not your own. In other words, you have been bought with a price. You are no longer now your own. You are God's, right? Amen? You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your what? I'm going to get you involved with what? Yeah, some of you are already not liking talking about this, are you? Yeah, okay. All right. Now, remember last week or two weeks ago, actually, is what I said was, is that most believers or Christians would think, yeah, I can do with every commandment listed except for the one that requires me to to uh, honor a Sabbath day. Remember I said that two weeks ago? For those of you who are here, if you weren't here, th just trust me, I did, okay? I did say that. Now, the thing about it is, is our society and our culture, which, by the way, includes those non-believers, and, and I put in my notes even some believers, because it, this is getting so skewed that even believers are not adhering to this principle anymore. All right? but certainly not uh, not unbelievers, uh, have a real issue with this commandment, okay? They do. Our society now feels that sex outside of marriage is terribly old-fashioned. In other words, if you save yourself for your God-given partner, society is going to tell you that's old-fashioned. By the way, I want to tell you something. God intended for you to be old-fashioned. It is, okay? All right. Um, now, by the way, it doesn't, shouldn't surprise us that uh, the society thinks this because our society is even redefined what marriage is. So I'm going to make that clear today in case some of you have this is a gray area for you. It is between one man and one woman, period. Okay. So let's just define it, okay? If anybody has a problem with that, let's just go ahead and define it. So now, um, so I want to warn you today that what we're going to talk about is sex. Now, men, notice how many ladies that was, right? Okay. Uh, I figured it would be more men. Men are not going to say anything, you know. 
But you're not going to be nearly as uncomfortable again hearing about this as I am going to be talking about it. Okay, I just want you to know that. Um, anyway, um, you're looking at a man who cannot, and I want to tell you this, the reason why I am so uncomfortable with this is because you are looking at a guy, and my family will back me up, that will not even walk through a lingerie department in a store. I want nothing to do with it, and I will walk around the store before I have to go in anywhere close to that. So this is how uncomfortable I am, okay? So just, just so you know uh, that I am. All right, now. <laughs> oh, boy. And there are going to be some things that I'm fixing to say today that you're going to think, oh, I've never heard a preacher say that. Man, I don't need these guys helping me, that's for sure. <laughs> so let me just ask you a real pointed, blunt question. Did God create sex? Okay, most of you agree he did that. Okay, now, ladies, contrary to popular belief, men did not create that. <laughs> Unless, of course, you think God's a man. And some of you may, okay? In which case you think, well, yeah, that's, that's why he created it, all right? Um, but we did not mutate out of some unknown form, right? We didn't, we didn't do that. God formed us, okay? He made us in addition to realizing that God created sex and God created us. He also created our sexual parts, okay? He did. God formed you and I to have pleasure. All right? Now, I, some of you are already squirming. I can see you. It's all right. This was his idea. Okay? I want you to understand that how he created you with the desire that he created you with, with the parts that he created you with, are his idea. Getting less and less and less. The question might be, did God do too good of a job on our sexual urges? That might be the question, right? Some of us might have. What was this his plan? Now, I, I, the thing about it is, did you, do you think God was walking through the Garden of Eden after he created Adam and Eve? And do you, you know, we know in the Bible that God used to have walks with Adam and Eve. And do you imagine that maybe one of those days that, that God was out there and he's walking along, and he goes, man, I wonder where those guys are. And all of a sudden, he hears Adam. Yeah, we got time before he gets here. <laughs> and so he walks over where he hears Adam, and he looks down and he goes, Ooh, I didn't expect him to be doing that. <laughs> Do you think God did that? No. No, God fully understood the desire of a man and a woman, and that is what he planned, didn't he? Right? Okay, good. Yes. Pleasure was his idea. All right, good. Um, <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, he made the parts of man and woman to fit together. Purposely made them that way. Um now, uh, he did that for you and I to have pleasure and intimacy with our marriage partner. All right? He did that. Now, um, interestingly enough, um, there is a good, healthy sexual desire, and it is in marriage. Right? Okay. <laughs> Some of you are still not going to agree with me. Are you? The word lust in the Greek, actually means strong desire. Did you know that? Now, isn't it interesting how we've managed to take the word lust and completely distort it? 
We've completely distorted that word. But the word lust in the Greek means having a very strong desire. Now, Jesus had a strong desire. And I want you to look with me at Luke twenty two fifteen. Luke twenty two fifteen, And it says, he said to them, I have eagerly desired. Okay? So we could actually, in the context of this scripture, say, Jesus could have said, I have eagerly lusted to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Because that is what the word means. You with me? You know, I've had young men ask me a question, they'll say, well, pastor, you just don't understand the overwhelming desire that I have in this particular area. So I want to tell you, young men, and then some of you older guys, too, that pastors are human, too. Okay? <laughs> When we swim with the family, we do not walk on water. We sink like a rock like the rest of you larger folks, okay? I just want you to understand that. Good. A man, uh, any man including pastors, should enjoy their sex life with their spouses so they will not be tempted to go or do anything else. Okay? Good. Despite what many church people think, you do not have to be a prude to serve God. You do not. God actually created you and I to have pleasure inside of marriage. Um, and again, Jesus understands this desire. All right, and I want you to, to hear me here real quickly because a lot of us think that, well, God's God. There's no way he could possibly know how this works and let alone in our culture today. But I want to tell you that Jesus was a human being. He understood desire. Okay? You hearing me? He understood desire. He was fully God, fully man, without sin, but that does not mean that he did not fully understand the desire for sexual fulfillment. Now, contrary to what you have seen, written, or watched on TV, I want to put a myth to bed because it is just the most outright lie I've ever heard in my entire life. Jesus did not have a relationship with Mary Magdalene. Right? I want you to understand that. I don't care what you read. He did not have that. Now, history shows that Mary Magdalene was older, actually a little bit older than his mother. So on top of, uh, uh, of him not doing that because of the purity of Jesus Christ, it would have been just plain weird. Right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, you can commit adultery in your body, but God designed you to have full pleasure inside of marriage. Okay, we good with that point? You better be because I'm not going to go back and rehash it. I promise you that. Number two. Number two. You can also commit adultery in your soul. You can also commit adultery in your soul. Proverbs 6 32, if you've got your Bible, Proverbs 6, 32, but a man who commits adultery has no sense. I think that's pretty interesting, don't you? That's pretty black and white right there. Whoever does so destroys himself. And by the way, the King James Version says he commits adultery, he destroys his own soul. He destroys his own soul. The word destroy means to corrupt to ruin, to spoil, to waste, or to rot. Now, I want to tell you something, guys. I believe with all my heart that God can redeem a person. Okay? I, I want you to understand this. God can redeem you. God can redeem me. If we've ever had an issue in this area, I don't want you to walk out here thinking you're doomed going to hell because God can redeem you for something like this. Okay? He can. All right. Um, now, the soul is made up of three things, the mind, the will, and the emotions. The mind, the will, and the emotions. Um, it's made up of how you think about things, how you feel about things, and then the decisions that you make. All right? We good with that? 
Um, I want you to understand that when I preach on Sundays like today, uh, probably more specifically maybe some other sermons, but uh, there is a pattern to what I try to do when I preach a sermon to you. I want to appeal to your rational thinking, but I also want to appeal to your emotions. Okay, so every sermon has got at least those two elements in it. Now, why would I do that? It's because some of you are thinkers. Some of you rationally think about things or you think about things a lot. Some of you base your decisions on total emotion, right? And so when, when you preach a message to a congregation as diverse as what we have here uh, in age group and everything else, you have to leave it wide enough that you're catching everybody, okay? All right, just giving you a little bit of uh, preaching 101 here. So good messages touch both of these areas. For you thinkers, good message gives you something to think about. And for you folks who are making decisions based off of feelings, a good message causes you to feel something down deep inside. Now, you can commit adultery in your mind and you can commit adultery in your emotions. All right. You can have a wrong relationship in your mind with someone, and you can have a wrong relationship in your emotions with someone. Now, this kind of broadens the spectrum a little bit, doesn't it? Okay, yeah. Any thought or feeling towards another person outside of marriage is wrong. Now, you can do this before you're married too, by the way, guys. You can do this before you're married. Um, Solomon 3.5, the Song of Solomon, says this, Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. In other words, do not awake these feelings inside of you until it is pleasurable to God, and pleasurable to God will be inside your marriage. Just as there are things that lead to murder, there are things that lead to adultery. Things in the mind lead to adultery. You ever heard the word fantastic? How many of you use the word fantastic a lot? Some of you? Okay. Fantastic. Um, the definition of fantastic is this, appearing as if conceived by an unrestrained imagination and that's the word i want you to keep in mind an unrestrained imagination by the way the root word for fantastic is fantasy okay that's the root word now understand god actually designed you and me to live in a fantasy but he designed us to live in a fantasy with the person we are married to our marriage partner Okay? Elders, there's not going to be anybody here next week, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I'll we'll probably need to. I just want to tell you, though, guys, you know, for those of you who have been married for a while and you're just, uh, you know, I tell you what, it's just as wonderful as it was the very first day you got married. You can honestly say that your marriage is fantastic. Right? Yeah, good. Okay. It is also a fantasy. I'm not looking at many of you today. I'm, I'm doing that on purpose. So affairs start in the soul before they ever get to the body. Okay? I want you to look at Matthew 5, 27 through 28. Matthew 5, 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Not my words. All right, that's Jesus' words. Lust precedes adultery. All right, I want you to write that down. Lust precedes adultery. And I want, then I want you to look at what precedes lust, all right? 
Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. So looking proceeds lust. Looking proceeds lust. Potiphar's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. In other words, she looked before she lusted. King David, you remember the story of King David, as he stared off of his balcony to Bathsheba, he looked before he lusted. Right? Good. For you and I to protect our mind, our heart, our soul, we must make a covenant with our eyes. We must make a covenant with our eyes. Now, guys, I'm going to give you a quick word of warning. Lady, this is not for you. This is for the men. All right, from one man to another. Ready? If you're sly and think that wearing sunglasses <laughs> will prevent your wife from noticing which way your eyes are moving, there is an important step that you need to remember. Don't turn your head. Free advice, by the way. <laughs> so adultery can happen in the body and the soul, but it also can happen in the third place, the spirit. It can happen in the spirit. And by the way, I think most people don't realize that uh, adultery can happen in your spirit, but it can. Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united. And by the way, the King James Version says joined. And I like the word joined a lot better, to be honest with you. Um, but he's joined to his wife, or he's, she's joined to her husband. And they become one flesh. Now, if I have married you, and there are probably some in here that I have, I have prob most likely used this. Because I like using this. I like, I, when we come into a wedding ceremony, I think this paints a very vivid picture of exactly what God intended for us to do when he put man and woman together. To be united, to be inseparable, to be one flesh. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to think exactly alike or do things exactly alike, does it? Okay, if you do, I want to talk to you. Okay, um... But, in other words, God created us to be joined physically, okay? Their flesh or physical cells match their marriage partner's physical cells. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, good. This, message, this passage goes on to say that a man will leave his father and mother and, and as the old King James says, cleave to his wife. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I honestly believe that cleaving takes time. All right? Cleaving takes time. But the idea is for the two to mesh into one. Um, now, some of you who've been married for a long time, how many of you have been married here for, uh, well, let's say 40 years plus? Oh, that's a lot. Good. That's nice. Awesome. Do you ever get to the point, maybe after 30 years, maybe 35 years, that you can start finishing each other's sentences? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, you've been with that person for so many years that you begin to understand how they think and what they're about to say and how they feel. That is cleaving together, isn't it? You see how that picture's painted? Uh, yeah, it's a great picture. All right, um... So, God created us to be joined physically. Uh, this scripture is repeated four different times, okay? Jesus says it, and then Paul says it. Now, I want you to understand, three different times he refers to the husband and wife, the marriage partner. But there is one time that it does not. So, I want you to look at it with me. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? 
And by the way, I, I put under here a note for me, and this is a note to myself. Maybe it's a note to you. We should really consider how we treat the body. Because if this is supposed to be a temple, right now it's not a very attractive temple. You know? You, you see what I'm saying? But the Bible does say that. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? And then the word right after it says, never. That would be foolish, right? Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But this is the part that's a little different. Verse 17. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So the same process happens when we are united with God. Right? If a man leaves his father and mother and joins his, with his wife, they are one flesh. However, if he leaves that wife and joins with another, he is now one flesh with that other woman. It's going to get kind of tough in here. All right? Y'all got your steel toes because it's going to get tough for a minute. There is a leaving and cleaving that happens followed by a oneness. Now, I want you to write that down. I'm going to wait on you. It's important. There is a leaving and cleaving that happens followed by a oneness. So let me explain this. Uh, and by the way, I especially want to explain it to you single folks, all right, which would include the youth down here. Um, did you know, and let me give you guys a heads up, did you know that your parents can tell when you've been active sexually without you telling them? Okay, I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up, okay? And here's how I know this. is because you have to leave to cleave. So if you've started experimenting, uh, experimenting sexually, then what you've done is you've left your mother and father and started cleaving to whoever your sexual partner is, and your parents can tell that because there's something in their spirit that says they're not like they used to be. Uh, by the way, adults, that goes for us too. Okay? That goes for us too. Yeah. Um, something in the spirit realm begins to happen, causing that person to flat check out. By the way, a married couple can tell after, just after a few days or weeks when one partner begins having an affair. They check out. They leave. They leave the relationship. They may physically still be in the household, but their heart, mind, spirit, and soul has already left the building. Okay? Um, but verse 17 says, But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So the same thing applies. Do you really think that we can take members of our bodies, including your spirit with Christ, and join to another and there not be a spiritual consequence to that decision? All right? Um, by the way, I want you to understand you don't lose your salvation. All right? Your salvation is not based on your works. Your salvation is based on grace. All right? But you do lose something. You lose your intimacy with God. Okay? We cannot convince ourselves that we are in a passionate, intimate relationship with Jesus when we are cheating on him. There is a leaving, there is a leaving of the Holy Spirit and attaching ourselves to a demonic one. I want you to think about that for a minute. By the way, demonic spirits run in tribes. They don't tend to run by themselves. When you commit adultery, you have to lie. You have to be deceptive. You have to be manipulative. You have to be prideful, arrogant, selfish, and the list just goes on and on and on. And all of those are demons that when you commit adultery, you've left the Holy Spirit and you begin to cling to those demonic spirits. Have you ever wondered why there's so many thou shall nots? 
And I want to tell you this, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy. He's not sitting here trying to make your life miserable. He's trying to do just the opposite. He's trying to save you from making a disastrous mistake that will follow you around for years to come. He wants you to be fulfilled. Now, so let me explain to you why any premarital or extramarital sex will destroy your life. And then we're going to get on to the end of this. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let's talk about premarital first. When I perform a wedding ceremony, um, there is something I ask the couples to do. In fact, I've asked them to do it since I've been the pastor here. Um, I, I, I traditionally don't know what a couple's been involved with prior to them coming to my office and saying, hey, preacher, can you marry us? Because sometimes even couples come to me that are not even part of this church. And they'll say, hey, we, need a, we, need a cow, we want a cowboy preacher to marry us. I said, that's great. Are you willing to sit here and listen to what I have to say? Because if you're not, you may want to look for another cowboy preacher. Because I've got some stuff I want to tell you about first. And the first thing I'm fixing to tell you is I don't want you sleeping together until we've had that marriage ceremony. I guarantee you that they have walked out this door, even though they've been pleasurable to me, and I bet I have been cussed up one side, down the other. I'm, I'm just pretty sure of it. But the thing about it is, is I want to make sure they at least have an opportunity to live like Christ wants them to live prior to them coming together in marriage. You know, understand the significance of that. Um, but there is a reason. Someone might ask, uh, look, we're going to get married anyway. What difference does it make? I've heard this a thousand times if I've heard it once. So really does it matter? Because, you know, we're going to get married, you know, so if, if we're already doing this, is, there, is why is that a problem? And in fact, uh, one lady asked me, he said, well, what difference does a sheet of paper make? And, and my answer there was absolutely no difference at all. Because I'm going to tell you a marriage license is not going to judge you whether you have premarital sex or not. Okay? <laughs> the piece of paper doesn't care. All right? Now, what makes the difference is the blessing of God. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. Marriage is hard enough. But if you try to do that without the blessing of God, you are on a uphill road all the way. Okay? You really are. Okay? Sure. Now, again, I want you to understand, you can repent and move into a right relationship with God, okay? So, that you're not doomed, it, it, you know, if you do that, okay? So, I just want to make sure we know that. So, ladies, listen to me. This is how you will ruin your blessing if you give a man what he wants. And I've got underlined and red ink up here that says, ladies, you can be assured that he wants it. No doubt, okay? In order to have premarital sex, you have to be deceptive to do it. And the young people? <laughs> I doubt there's ever been a conversation that went like this. Parents, where are you going? Oh, we're going out to have sex. <laughs> we all have a good time. No parent has ever said that, that I know of, hopefully. You have to lie, you have to be deceptive, and then you begin in developing these habits that you shouldn't have ever had at all. It's an appetite for that. And suddenly you're carrying those same kind of habits into a marriage. You begin developing an appetite God never intended you to develop. You develop an appetite for sneaking around sex. So you get married. And now you don't have to sneak around anymore. 
unless, of course, you got kids, right? Then you have to sneak around a lot. Now, ladies, listen to me again. If you develop this appetite in him and you get married, you will never be able to satisfy it. This is why he starts talking to the coworker, or you start developing emotional feelings towards somebody else because they will listen to you. He will begin feeling an appetite that the two of you created when you stepped outside of the boundaries of marriage. The very covenant that God said to protect and cherish. Hmm. This becomes a vicious cycle. Because even if he leaves you for her, then the cycle will start all over again. This is why so many people just want to live together and not get married. And they do that because they know down deep in their hearts that they're doing something wrong. And it's affecting their relationship. And it's affecting their spirit. By the way, this is also the reason why people get married three, four, five, and six times because the appetite is never fulfilled. So what do you do if you've experienced premarital marital sex or you've had an affair? All right, I want to give you the, the, the answer to this. It would be unfair for me to point all this out and not give you something to combat it. You confess it and you repent from it. All right, let me explain that. Confession in this matter is tough. It's tough. You have to be very honest about it, don't you? But then, on top of confessing it, the idea of repentance means to turn from. It doesn't mean you keep going down that same road again and again and again and again. Confessing it and never repenting from it doesn't change anything. I mean, if you've been guilty of this, and by the way, I would imagine a lot of people have. And maybe this has been in your spirit for a very long time. Maybe you have fought this and fought this and fought this, and you just knew down deep in your heart there was something going on. Then the Bible tells us that we need to confess it. We need to confess it to our, the Father, and then if it's an affair, maybe you need to confess it to your spouse. Now, I realize that's not an easy thing to do. But healing will not happen unless that happens. And then you need to repent from it. You need to turn away from it and say, this is not my life anymore. Anymore. And by the way, let me just tell you, if you've had premarital sex and you're looking to have, be married, I'm going to encourage you to do one thing for me. I'm going to encourage you to confess and repent from that right now so that your marriage partner will be the one and the only that you experience the most gratifying and, and satisfying pleasure inside the home. Oh. You know, why confess it? Well, it needs to be brought out into the light. Um, why bring it into the light? Because Satan works in the darkness. I'm very sure right now over the radio, on Pure Country, and over Facebook Live, and in this house today, the spirit of many people are beginning to squirm. And I would imagine some people are very uncomfortable. And I would imagine some of you cannot wait to get out of here. But I'm also really sure that confession and repentance is needed. I want you to know something. And I want you to have 100% confidence in this. That Palapena Cowboy Church is here to help you move from the darkness into the light. There is forgiveness and grace on the other side of this issue in your life. There is hope for the cycle being broke, and there is hope for, a, for satisfying a God-filled relationship that will be blessed in your life to come. So I want to give you one more tool, and then we're going to pray and be dismissed. <coughs> I want to use Celebrate Recovery for that. Uh, celebrate recovery is hurts, habits, and hangups. We meet on Thursday night. 
And I'm telling you, I don't know that this has ever been ever been added to that. I don't even know that we've ever talked about that. But maybe y'all have in your group, but I don't think I've ever had from the pulpit. But this is an opportunity for you to work through an issue just like this in a controlled environment with people that have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So I want you to get involved with that. If this is something you seriously need some help with, uh, Thursday night, 6.15, I want you to meet us back here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to feed you a meal, and then we're going to get together. We're going to worship, and then I want you to begin to work through some of this issue of adultery or even maybe premarital sex so that you can become what God intended you to be inside the relationship he intended you to be in. So let's pray. Again, I want, to, I want you to understand that this is not an unforgivable offense. You're not doomed to the depths of hell because of an offense like this. You might be doomed from the depth to the depths of hell because you haven't given your life to Christ, but not because you've done this. I want to give you the opportunity, first and foremost, to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's where you need to start. I mean, you're going to have to have help moving through this kind of battle. And Jesus is the only one I know that can help you do it. Second of all, you need Jesus to repent. And so I'm offering you that today. He's offering that to you today. The Holy Spirit is in this place to touch your mind, your soul, and your body if you have an issue in this area. Or maybe you just need to give your life to Christ because you've been convicted of something else today. But I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to pray with you today. And, and as we pray today, I would like for you to uh, carefully search your own mind and your heart. And maybe the question that all of us need to ask is, have we committed adultery on Christ? Father, we come to you this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. The quietness of this moment, Father, this has been a difficult message. I, I don't think there's anybody in here that can say this wasn't a difficult message to hear. But, Father, your word convicts us. And, Father, we have to tackle the tough subjects just like we tackle maybe some of the little bit lighter ones. And, Father, maybe for many of us in here today, this has really hit home. So, Father, today I ask that you would just move in our hearts, that we would understand that there is grace on the other side. Father, that your son went to Calvary, paid our price, took our sin and our punishment, and he took it all upon himself so that we might be redeemed, so that we might be whole. Father, we believe that you died for us. We believe that you would die for that sin of adultery. And Father, right now, we just give that to you. We ask that you move in our hearts, Father, that you change our lives and you change the, our thinking. Father, that we would learn to protect our eyes and our hearts. Father, that we would learn how to follow you. Father, we believe that you rose from the grave. Father, that we have victory through your resurrection. Father, victory over sin, victory over death, and victory over hell. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you did that for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.